So here's kind of a personal greedy question for myself. Um, we, um, our family rents from a relative and they're a relative that we really trust. They've been like more super generous to our family and they have no reason they have enough money to not rip us off. They've, they've been kind. <laughs> and, um, and the area, it's kind of a, uh, it's a little bit more of a retirement type area, but it is really mm. nice. And it's next to a lake, a big giant lake that's very popular, especially in the summers. Mm. Um, the winter time is, and I think this is relevant to my question, the winter time, it's very snowy. Um, and it's very much like people maybe are leaving. And so we're about an hour and a half from Manhattan. And mm. uh, people do come out here and buy second homes. And I think people are leaving Manhattan in general, similar to the Bay Area. They're, they're leaving to other places. Yeah. So I think the appreciation of this area will continue to go up. And the homes all around here continue to go up and just being really close to the lake. So my question is, is it worth considering buying a first home from a relative just for the sake of possibly having some lesser fees and the trust and not having to do the research, knowing that the property is, has been inspected um, and there's nothing major major wrong with it to your knowledge. What, what do, you, do you have any thoughts on that based on the limited yeah. info that I gave you? Yeah, for sure. I, I don't have any problem with doing deals with family members. Um, I think that you should, if you do a deal with a family member, you should do it as if they're not a family member, right? Um, and if they have issues with that, you got to figure out why there's issues with that. Makes right. Sense. So like, um, if you're, if you're going to sit down and you're gonna be like, okay, we're going to purchase this home. Um, we're going to get a mortgage. You know, anytime you go get a mortgage, they're already going to require you to do a bunch of stuff. You know what I mean? Like they're going to want inspections. It doesn't matter yeah. whether or not you think that it's fine. That's true. Right. Um, it's because they want to know and they don't know you guys. Right. Um, but yeah, I would follow all the same rules do all the same contracts, you know, everything the same, because, you know, at some point when one person, and it could be you in this case, you know, protecting them decides like, ah, you know, I've changed my mind. And then you ditch it and you did some sort of handshake deal, right? That could put them in a situation that's really compromising. So it's always smart to do everything properly. Even if it's with a family member, that's the advantage is that it's just easier to talk to these people because you already know who they are. Right. Um, and I, and I, I don't have any experience with this, but I would imagine that like the people who the family members who don't want to do that are, usually have ulterior motives, right? right? I did a, a reaction video to someone a while back who wanted to buy something from their dad and there was like real iffy stuff happening with the deal. Right. And I think that what it was, was that the dad like wanted the daughter to pay for the property, but didn't want to sign the property over to her, like wanted to keep ownership of it himself. Right. Well, that's real shady. Like, why would you yeah. put your daughter in a position like that? Right? Like, yeah. even you could say, like, okay, in the future, like, I will take care of her and she'll get it when I die. It'll be fine. But, like, how much stuff could happen in between now and then? Right? And then you get desperate and then you just sort of, like, you know, steamroll your own daughter. You know what I mean? I don't know. Is this not a good position to put yourself in? I, but, yeah. oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. No, I was going to say, I totally agree with that principle. Friends or family with business just. Uh, you know, it's the trusted but verified type of thing, and for both people's yeah. sake. And something weird comes up, you say, "Oh, we just default to the to the thing." We kind of have to. Yeah. Um, but you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, the the other thing I would consider is, like, you have to know that you have a personal bias now, right? Because you already live in. Yeah. I'm assuming you live in this property, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if you said that or not, but I'm assuming yeah, that's what yeah. you're talking about. You live in the property, and then you're renting it from them, and you're going to purchase it at some point. You like the area, right? But you have a personal bias now because you're you're already living there, which means that it's going to be real easy for you to mentally skip information that doesn't work with what you're already trying to accomplish. Does that make sense? Great point. Yes. Yeah. So Very I would sit down and make sure all the numbers are what they are, right? And the way that you can do that is um, find another area in the country that is is similar to what you got going now. So like house prices are similar, rents are kind of similar, growth is kind of similar. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know of places that are like that, but maybe, you know, places in Michigan might be like that or, you know, something kind of similar outside of Chicago because, you know, you're kind of outside of New York. It's kind of the same idea, right? Um, and then do the math on that area, like find a property that kind of matches what you're doing now, do all the math, figure out everything that it would take for you to move there. 
and for it to financially make sense. And then you have to really tell yourself, like, would I actually do this, you know, at some point? Like, if I really wanted to move there, like, would, would, does the math work? Yeah. Right. And if it doesn't work, then you got to ask yourself, why is it that I'm okay doing it here where I'm at now? Right. Like, what's the difference? Uh, I, right. I'm a big fan of trying to find those, those biases. So mm -hmm. that's great. I mean, I was wondering, you know, if you have any thoughts since the last part of this question, as far as financial savings, um, assuming everything's uh, legal and kosher, do you, do you have to get an agent? Cause if you didn't have an agent, would it be for sale by owner? Is that cheaper or is it you still have to use an agent legally or something like that? So, um, this is something that you're going to have to look at your state. Every state uh -huh. rules are different. Um, in some states they require both parties to have an agent. Like you don't have an option. You mm -hmm. both parties have to have an agent. Now, most states will allow one party to represent themselves as the agent, right? So if you're a real estate agent and you're selling a property, you can represent yourself or you're buying a property. You could represent yourself. They usually allow that. Sometimes some states will allow um, one agent to be involved. I think that this is the most common case. I don't think like, so the one agent would be like, you know, you both already mutually agreed to stuff. You just need an agent to sit down and do the middle work. That ends up being cheaper because, you know, you don't like uh, you don't need to pay two agents. You pay one. Mm -hmm. And then in a lot of cases, if one person in that deal is already an agent and you already trust them, then they don't they might not take any kind of, uh, you know, uh, commissions off of that. So you heard those guys that do those like, you know, buy we'll buy your house kind of deals. Right. Mm -hmm. Where they like call up a bunch of people and they're like, are you looking to sell? I'll buy your house. You know, no, no fees. The reason that they're doing that is that state allows for a single agent deal to take place and they're an agent, right? So they're, they're mm -hmm. basically saying like, look, you know, like we could save a bunch of money, you know, yeah, like I'm looking to buy your house for cheaper than what it would go for on the market, but you'll get more cash in your pocket than you would if you were to sell it through an agent, right? That's what they're trying to argue for. Um, and then I think there are some states where you don't have to have an agent. You could just go through like a title company, but I don't know if those are very common. You'd have to look that up. I don't know. I don't have an idea on I, that one. That's helpful. I, I have two other quick questions, hopefully quick for you. Um, Airbnb or long-term, we kind of talked about this a little bit, and you, you said a little bit about those. Are you mm -hmm. doing both, or are you just sticking with um, the short-term? I'm sorry, I should say short-term or long-term. Yeah. yeah. Really. <laughs> um, but um, are you sticking uh, solely with short-term now, or are you do any long-term properties? Um, as of right now, I don't have any long-term properties. I just have short-term rentals, which are like STRs for short, um, or vacation rentals. People will call them that too. Um, but I do plan on diversifying into some long-term stuff. I think what I want to do is, you know, maybe some kind of apartment complexes. I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, you know, I have to look more into that. I've started kind of looking into it. You know, I would need quite a bit more money to get into that yeah. than, um, than short-term rentals. Um, the reason I really like short-term rentals is because I feel like, um, and I, and I kind of covered this a bit in one of my videos, but I feel like, um, I come from a customer service background. So it wasn't until like five years ago or so where I got a job that wasn't in customer service. Right. Um, and, and the Marine Corps, obviously that mm. wasn't really customer service. That's like the opposite of customer service. <laughs> um, but in between there, I did a lot of stuff in retail and I did a lot of stuff with like major retail companies that are like really good at what they do. And you could kind of see the difference between like, you know, a company that's like trying to just meet their bottom line and someone who is like, they, they actually know what, you know, minutia it takes to really promote their thing and to, you know, to give that experience to people that they keep coming back for. And so when I was watching, we were watching like a, um, a Netflix show about Airbnbs. Right. And this guy, he just turned his personal residence into an Airbnb and then he moved and he even left like mail on the table. Like, I mean, it was, it's just stuff that it shouldn't take you too many brain cells to figure out, like, doesn't make sense for an Airbnb. Yeah. Right. And so I thought about it and then I started looking at Airbnbs in the area and they're like, the, the quality is just really not all great. Like the houses feel kind of like they were lived in by somebody else. Um, cleanliness isn't super high. Um, you know, they're just, they look like they're just trying to, you know, 
cover their bottom line for that property or whatever. And so I thought, okay, well, the, the easiest way to beat everybody in this market is just to produce something that people would want to go to. And that's it, right? And I'll pay extra to make sure that it's cleaner by getting the best company that does it. I'll, I'll make sure I get like, you know, so I get like a, a design company that comes in and furnishes it and it costs me extra to do it, but the properties look great, right? Wow. Um, and that just beats everybody else out. They just can't compete with that. And so I've just kind of kept that process going. Like I said, I figured out the formula, so I'm just going to keep reproducing it. But um, I think that, you know, short-term rentals just by themselves aren't diversified. They're riskier. The amount of income I get, you know, fluctuates depending on what the market looks like. Obviously COVID hit and then that was a thing, right? So um, I think that I got to get into something long-term. So long-term, you're going to make less money, but there's so much less headache for long-term stuff, right? It's a trade-off. Yeah, you get like um, consistent income. You don't really have to think about it too much. Um, they pay all the bills. You have to get insurance, but just long-term rental insurance, which is way cheaper than like, you know, what you would buy for your own property, right? You, you require them to get insurance. So that, that's why it's cheaper for you, right? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff. You, you, um, renovations don't have to be crazy expensive and you can do them like real inconsistently. Like you could wait like 10 plus years and then do a renovation mm -hmm. or something. Cause you don't have to keep everything up to date and looking nice like you do in an Airbnb, right? Um, and then the only thing you really have to worry about is evictions. Airbnb, you don't have to think about that, that's but true. you get yourself a good property manager and they'll do all that stuff for you. So you don't have to think about it at all. Mm. Right. My last final question um, is kind of a weird one. So I'm just looking for more of a short term, a short answer because, um, yeah. Anyways, I've heard of these type of FHA loans that people, they get a house that's a little distressed and it's a special type of loan mm -hmm. that you can get the house repaired and then you go to live in it and then you're paying for some of the repairs within your, your first year mortgage. Have, is that something you've ever considered or advised to stay away from? Or I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Hmm. I think that you'd have to sit down and work those numbers out, hmm. right? If you're, if you are adding value and you can kind of guesstimate how much value you're adding and how much you're spending to add that value, and then what that is going to cost you over the course of that loan, then you might be able to do the numbers to figure out if it's actually worth it or not. Right. Okay. So like if you spend, like if you take a loan out for 20 grand, so anytime you take like, you know, for the FHA loan, if they're going to add on extra for repairs, that's just, a, that's just a, a loan, right? It doesn't matter if it's attached to another loan. It's just, you're just taking out debt for a thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So you take out debt for a thing. Let's say you're going to take out $10,000 worth of debt. And then you turn around and you put it in your home and that adds $50,000 worth of value. And the interest you pay on that $10,000 over the course of the next 30 years is 5,000, right? All right, so you spent $5,000 plus, you know, you had to pay back the principal. So 10,000, so $15,000 and you added $30,000 worth of value to your property. You made $15,000, right? And then supposedly that's gonna appreciate as well, right? So like you add in, so if it's 30,000 and then that appreciates along with the rest of the house because it's part of how the house works, right? Um, at some point that starts depreciating because, you know, you hit a point where you have to re you have to redo it because it goes out of style, <laughs> right? But yeah, if you can do the math on that and it works, I would do it. If it doesn't work, then I wouldn't do it. So, you know, most people, like just to caveat that a smidgen, most people, if you hire a contractor to come in and renovate your home, the value they add won't be more than um, what you're spending, mm. right? That's not universally true, but I would say on average, that's true. Okay, good to know. You gave me a lot of information today. I got some homework to do, but this was like super insightful, and I hope it was helpful for anybody else who's in in my position. This was great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. I super appreciate it. That was fun. I like. A lot of stuff that I don't often think about, like that I know, but I don't often like mm. think about, right? And uh, you're like hitting all the the spots coming from you know perspective on the other side. I think that's real helpful, and I think you gave me a lot of uh, you know ideas to make new episodes with. So <laughs> super yeah, appreciate plenty, that. I had plenty of questions. We we got through yeah. all the questions, so thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, so if you see some episodes coming out soon that basically just answer your questions, great. Don't be surprised. It. I appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thanks, Ryan. I super appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I'll see you next time. Talk soon.